Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. And you want a quality education that makes you more marketable in an ever increasingly competitive landscape. I am Mark Stucker and I'm a college coach. And I am Anika Madden and I am a parent. It is Thursday, August 8th, and welcome to episode number 80, Admissions Advice for Non-Traditional Students. In this week's news, when colleges seek diversity through Photoshop, and we're at number 80, and Mark is giving admissions advice for non-traditional students when choosing a college. And it's time for a bonus episode, and we're going to be talking about a new push for test optional one year after our big University of Chicago breaking news. And this week, Mark interviews Daniel Green. He's a parent and loyal listener to your College Bound Kid and understanding how the Trello app can help you stay organized with the college process. It never rains in Southern California. (laughs) It never rains in Southern California. Remember Tony, when you Tony, told me Tony to fan, Mark? Thing again? Remember that? <laughs> Tony, 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 I'll let you take a stab at it. It's fine. I love that. Well, it doesn't <laughs> rain in Northern California apparently either because, you know, Nika, I was at Stanford from Tuesday mm-hmm. to Saturday. Uh, an amazing program. They bring in 40 counselors and they give us like this certificate. It looks like a diploma basically for going through their counselor training. And yeah, at the cool. yeah, and at the end of the episode, for those who aren't tired of us yet, well, I'll talk to a little bit, a little bit to our listeners about what I learned about Stanford in my in my five day uh, pilgrimage out there to Palo Alto, <laughs> where the sun was shining. <laughs> Awesomeness! Can't wait for it. And the other thing, Anika, it is a year and a half. Can you believe it? We've been doing this year no, and a half. No, no, I cannot. No, I cannot. Where Doesn't did that time fact. fly? Uh, I should be used to it, but you never get used to I it. Know, the time just well said. Well gone. Said, well said. <laughs> it's also six months since we announced that we are gonna stay commercial free. And we're going to see mm-hmm. if we can partner with our listeners to help us with our expenses. And our listeners have stepped up and they've encouraged us and just really showed that they value what we're, we're trying to do here. And I thought some of our, we might want to share with our listeners a little bit about where their money goes when they give. Because I think in general, we've said that it helps with our staff, but we actually have six part-time people that we pay. We have a sound engineer. We have a webmaster. We have an image editor, we have a writing editor, we have a graphic designer, and we have a music man. And then we also have three monthly subscriptions that we have every month to do with podcast technology. So we have nine regulars. And what did we do this morning, Anika? What did we interview? (laughs) Another one. (laughs) Well, another person. I shouldn't say another one. Yes, we're hoping to bring a 10th person into our team, and that would be a social media manager and marketer to try to get the word out. And mm-hmm. so we could not do this without you supporting our podcast. Um, we would be broke. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're still and broke. So, <laughs> yeah, we're still broke. <laughs> we'd be broker. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. But I think one 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 listener really uh, encouraged me this week because he reached out and, you know, gave us a donation. He said, Please stay commercial free. I don't know what I'm going to do if I hear one more podcast. And in the middle of the podcast, somebody breaks in talking about male enhancement or some craziness. So <laughs> don't, don't go to commercials. And and here's a little gift to help you out. So thank you all so much, everyone yes. who's given to keep us commercial free and to allow us to pay our staff. And hopefully the next year and a half will be better than the first year and a half. That's right. That's the goal. So, Anika, you know what time it is. Countdown time. Countdown time, yo. And we are looking at the 12 reasons why people fire the podcast. (laughs) Unsubscribe. That that cracks you up every time. It does. I hear your little chuckle over there. It really does. (laughs) Because this is clearly not encouraging y'all to fire us. We just thought this. Yes, really no good. hits, right? No <laughs> hits. Please don't do it. So this one, I feel, is like a really convicted of this one, Nika. Number mm-hmm. nine is co-host talking over each other. Oh, I have had quite a few, uh, quite a few of those. Yeah, it's tough. I've done it with you. Mm-hmm. It drives me crazy. I think our listeners. Have you really? Don't make- 
Well, I didn't, oh, good. You haven't noticed it? I haven't. Mm-mm. I don't feel good because sometimes when I'm going back and doing the editing, I'm like, oh, I talked over it, Nika. This is so mm. bad. And I said, well, it's not as before. bad as the ones I've heard. It's definitely oh, thank not you. bad. Yeah. I could trust me. John knows. I send a message saying on the sound engineer, can you please fix that? So the final <laughs> version doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> All right, let's jump into the episode. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right, Mark, today's article entitled When Colleges Seek Diversity Through Photoshop. And this is found or written by Mr. Uh, Scott Jassick, and it's found in Inside Hired Ed. Inside Higher Ed. Did I say that right? So, all righty. So, um, Mark, I'm sure you're so familiar with this, but some schools have gotten busted Photoshopping minority students into their marketing materials. And two of the schools mentioned in this article are York College of Pennsylvania and the University of Wisconsin of Madison, uh, who are both very, very predominantly white institutions. Now, when York gets called out in their scandal, um, their spokesperson actually had somewhat of a decent response. They say, oh, we were just trying to make sure we're reinforcing inclusivity on our campus um, so students know that all are welcome. Um, They also went on to acknowledge that recruiting minorities uh, were there. Let me say that in a a different tone. They've acknowledged that recruiting minorities to white institutions is a challenge. And so students... uh, and they know that students responding to ads when they when they see kids in ads that look like themselves, they respond better, basically. So I guess that was a pretty honest uh, response, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's definitely not just these two schools um, that the article you know is writing about that the culprits of this Photoshop and practice. But Jastic cites research that more than 75 percent of colleges appear to over represent black students in their view books. Lordy B. Mm-hmm. And how about his mark his reference to the most um, or that that most prospective students rely on a university's image to make their enrollment decisions? So, yikes, Marks, do you think that most is an accurate depiction? Um, if so, that's kind of scary. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I'd like to reverse it for once. I, what, what are your thoughts, Anika, on this? I think um, it's not I mean, it's, it's not surprising um, I think what's most disturbing about this is that these schools don't even have, you know, how about go get the one black kid or the one, you know, minority kid on campus and actually take the original picture with them in it. <laughs> I think the, uh, you know, the sheer and utter laziness around it is disturbing in itself. Um, but I do hate the fact, um, that statement really stuck with me about, you know, how these kids are making decisions and that's by what they see, you know, in their materials and uh, online or whatever, you know, what, whatever they are sending to them in the mail two or three times a month. Um, so it is disturbing, but I know it's, yeah, I know it happens. And, um, I just, I don't know, Mark, I'm in such a place where we don't do that, honestly, where we know that, you know, it's all what we've talked about forever. You know, you got to step your foot on these campuses, um, you know, you, you just got to be there front and center to really get that good old fashioned feeling of this is if, if this is a place that you want to be not just related to race, but to culture and to, you know, just, you know, academic rigor or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it, it is bad. When you say you're at a point where you don't do that, are you saying you're at a point where you've learned like not to rely on? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Materials they send mm-hmm. you and you got to make your evaluation off your on-site yep. visit. Yep, pretty much. Cool. Well, let me read the article and make some comments along the way. So, doctoring photographs to appear more inclusive may not end well. But colleges, historically, are more diverse in their admissions material than they are in real life. The new billboard for York College of Pennsylvania features a typical headline for admissions marketing, entitled, Envision the Possibilities at York College. Eight students smiling, one African-American, one Asian-American, one woman with her hair covered appears to be Muslim. But in the last week, the billboard turned from a source of pride to one of controversy. The original photograph shot for the billboard featured two white students who were then replaced with two students to reflect diversity. The original photo and the doctored one circulated in social media with arrows pointing out to show the change. So like they did one of those before afters 
you know, arrows mm-hmm. here, arrows there. So everybody just looking on social didn't have to read the article to get the gist of like what was going on. All right. And one of the students in the original photo shoot reached the photographer and she reported to a local news station what what he said. He was like, yeah, they just wanted a more diverse billboard. So we had to get two other students and we put them in there. When they went to show the person that had to approve the photo, it wasn't approved. So they had to rush to fix the problem. Spokesperson for York offered this defense of the photograph via email. Saying this, this photo reflects the diversity of students who live and learn at York. All those included are York students. So in an effort to reinforce inclusivity, we attempted to ensure that all students are represented and welcome. So this is uh, the point, uh, Anika, um, where I can at least give them credit for having noble motives, you know, Um, from a motive standpoint, right? Their intention was to attract more diversity. So at least I'm trying to find a little silver lining in there and give them some credit for something. All right. All right. At the same time, she said, the college was considering replacing the billboard. We're up against the deadline, but we should have made a better decision, she said. Now, I do like this because I don't like excuse making. So I do like that at least this individual owned it. I like that she said we should not have, we should have made a better decision. So I was feeling a little better after that. But it does get a little worse. So the students in the version that appeared in the end may all be York students, but data from U.S. Department of Education shows that the photo, as shot originally, may in fact better reflect the state of diversity of the college. The data shows 82% of York students were white, 6% Hispanic, 5% black, 4 multiple races, 2 Asian, and 1 other categories. Sunday afternoon, the college released a second statement. Now, this one I didn't like, uh, Nika, because this is Miss Ramirez, Ines Ramirez, and she didn't own it. So from Ines, Ines Ramirez, Assistant Director of Intercultural Student Life and International Support. And she says, in my opinion, the message of the photo was to show that your college of Pennsylvania welcomes students from diverse backgrounds and to feature our current students. And I think we succeeded at that. The photo was not meant to feature the current minority numbers at the college. So. Okay, maybe good motives again, Hmm. um, but own it, and she's not owning it. And the problem is, as you indicated, which I'll read here in a second, if people are making decisions and getting their perspective based on that, like, there are people that select colleges without visiting. Hmm. So that's what I don't like is the misleading here. So it goes on to say, we would need to use a group of more than 100 students to be truly reflective of our current data to feature all races, ethnicities, gender, sexual orientation. Religions, Ramirez said, as you know, minority re- stu- mi- as you know, minority student recruitment at mostly Caucasian institutions is very challenging, and we need to make sure our target market is included or featured in our publication. So this is kind of a classic case, Anika, of the, the ends justify the means, right? Mm-hmm. So in other words, it's hard to do. Everybody knows it's hard to do, so don't get all over us because we uh, cut a few corners here. Mm-hmm. Most students respond to ads that show others like themselves, she said. Well, I certainly don't disagree with that. Um, but I do think that Scott Jasek makes a really good point, um, in this article because he goes on to show it's not only York. Uh, so next thing says York is hardly the first college to be caught using Photoshop to project diversity after embarrassing incidents at two universities in 2000, many admission marketing leaders vowed to be more careful. Did you see the, you know, the pictures in the university? Of yeah, I did. yeah. The way they, they stuck the black they guys the black photo, guy yeah. in there. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sad. Oh, I see a little black guy in there. And then they, okay. So, yeah. So the biggest, most famous case for this was University of Wisconsin-Madison, which used a photograph of a cheering Badger fan at an athletic event, added a black student in the process. And then for use, and, they, and the reason why I think this one drew a lot of publicity, it was on the cover of their admission booklet. Mm. And so that was quite fascinating. So using Photoshop to change images raises ethical questions. But before everyone criticizes only York or Wisconsin, consider research found at most other colleges. Presumably by inviting particular students to post for photographs, they project more verse diversity in their view, book, view book and campuses than they actually have. And then this um, this part I found really fascinating, Anika, because here is the research they use from this sociologist at Augsburg University in Minnesota. And so I guess it's probably part of a dissertation. but um, This professor, along with a student, studied hundreds, hundreds of four-year colleges um, 
view books at random and found that this is fascinating. The research team counted the racially identifiable student photographs, and they also gathered data on the actual makeup of the student bodies. What did they find? On average, black students made up 7.9% of the colleges, but they were 12.4% of the view books. And so somebody might be thinking, well, you know, what's the difference between 7.9 and 12.4? That's actually 50% increase. Hmm. And not only black students, Asian students are also more likely to be found in view books than on campus. They make up 3.3% of the students, but they were 5.1%, another 50% increase. Researchers acknowledge that the appearance does not tell the story of race and identity, and they say they only counted clearly identifiable photos and feel less confident about figures for Latino students. Um, looked at another way, the researchers found that more than 75% overrepresented the black students. And then they asked the question, so why is it that the black students were so much more prevalent in the view book? And then this is a fascinating quote by Timothy Pippert, another sociologist. Uh, he says, black equals diversity for many people. If you show African-American students, people think that means you are you are diverse. That was what you think about that? Uh, disturbing. Kind of it's true, but it's disturbing. Ah! Right. <laughs> and then they say they are defining diversity as, listen, that face. Mm -hmm. That is an explicit, that right. face. That's also disturbing because America is, like, are we at the point where diversity equals black? Aren't we, like, beyond that? And we have a much more of a comprehensive view of diversity? That feels like so 1950s. Unfortunately not, apparently. Hippert along with two others, did an expanded version of the study in 2013. Oh, I, I cracked up, Anika, the name of this study. Ah, <laughs> uh, I don't I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, it's called We've Got Minorities. Yes, we do. <laughs> I thought that was clever. <laughs> We've Got Minorities. Yes, we do. A visual representation of race and, ethnic and ethnic diversity in college recruitment materials. Mm -hmm. And this was published in the Journal of Marketing for Higher Ed. Um. That is so funny, that name. I that, just, was I, 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 that was good. That was good. It was a good one. So that's the study that researchers found that the group most significantly represented was black students, uh, made up an average of 7.4% on the institutions, but 151 in the images. They were overrepresented by at 81. So 81.2% of the colleges overrepresented, uh, overrepresented their black community. And then... They talked to um, Nancy Long, a professor at the University of, Dem of Denver, and she just calls it like it is. She dubs this fake diversity, hmm. and it's her name for this, and she says something pretty deep. In an interview, she says, I do have sympathy for schools that want to portray themselves as exclusive through visual representation and materials. I understand what they're trying to do which is to say, send a message. This is a good place for people of color. But I thought this was like the knockout blow, like the whole punchline, the emphatic <clears throat> tone to the whole article. Then she added, the problem is that forcing attention and resources on aesthetic appearances instead of anything substantive. By substantive, she means adding financial aid for disadvantaged students. Stepping up recruiting efforts at high schools with many students from many backgrounds of of colleges that have a large share of minority students in admissions materials. Long said, I don't think their intentions are bad, but they are trying to take a shortcut to manage the appearance of something they have not achieved. And then the final line at colleges with meaningful efforts to recruit and retain minority students and to promote inclusivity. You don't have to pose a picture. You don't have to do Photoshop. You can just go to the student center, point a camera in any direction. Right. So uh, let me share just one or two other things and see if you have any final thoughts. If not, we'll mosey on over to our next section. Okay. So the bad news is that it's unethical and disingenuous, right? Mm -hmm. You're creating a perception totally different than who you are. Like we emphasize with students all the time, be your authentic self. Present yourself for who you are. Present yourself authentically in your extracurriculars. Present yourself authentically in your essays. Present yourself authentically in your choice of a major. Well, if I'm going to challenge students to be authentic in their present, in their application, 
I think we can challenge the adults to be the same way in how they portray their college. Right. The other problem is this is a disingenuous tactic and it has real life consequences. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this, Anika. Have you ever like taken a picture like at a family reunion uh, or anything and then showed the picture to the group and noticed what people do? First thing? <laughs> no. <laughs> what do you think they do? <laughs> what do you mean? After they see the picture? Yes. When they see the picture. Uh, I don't know. Laugh. They maybe. look for themselves. <laughs> Every time, oh, my hair was bad. Oh, I can't believe you got that picture. You're like, oh, okay, that's a, okay, like okay. this is human nature, right? Mm-hmm. Not just they, us. The first thing we do as humans when we see a picture is we go right and look at ourselves. Mm-hmm. I do. You know, it, it. it's funny. When I was just at Stanford, picture 40 counselors they took, they sent it to us. What did I do? Went, go look at myself. How did I come out looking? First thing. <laughs> so admission officers know that any student of color group or any gender, if it particularly if it's a mostly male school, the first thing you're going to do, look at yourself. Look on any admissions billboard. Look for something that looks like yourself. Mm-hmm. So this really can influence people. And I know it sounds bizarre. And I'm sure someone's thinking, duh, didn't they figure this out on their visit? Mm-hmm. But I don't know a stat on this, Anika, but a surprisingly high number of students don't even visit a college uh, before going, particularly if they're picking a college outside of their region. Mm, yeah. So that's all I had on on the article. Just um, I just have to read that last line one more time, though, by the professor Long at the University of Denver. At colleges with meaningful efforts to recruit and retain student minority students and to promote inclusivity, you don't have to pose a picture. You don't have to do Photoshop. You just go to the student center and point a camera in any direction. Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. We are doing something a little different than we normally do. If you are uh, a regular follower of our podcast and you have the book 171 Answers and you do what we best recommend to maximize the value of the podcast, you read the chapter and then you hear the podcast. Um, you're going to notice that what we're talking about today is not in chapter, doesn't line up with the chapter. It's the first time we've ever done that. And the reason for that is because the content in chapter 80 is something that we pretty much covered in episode 76 when we talked about mistakes parents make. So this gave me an opportunity, Anika, to Mm -hmm. what, what would be the chapter that I would add that I didn't write, that I didn't have before, right? Mm -hmm. And the one that I came up with is what are the opportunities for non-traditional students at college? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And sure, our podcast is called Your College Bound Kid. And sure, we talk about the traditional high school kid over 95% of the time on this podcast. But there's a huge number of non-traditional students. So what do you think I mean by traditional versus non-traditional student, Anika? I always... Sorry, I always honestly think of older people like me um, that are going back, <laughs> sitting in a freshman classroom. Your light ages older than the people around you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's honestly pretty much all I think about this older people <laughs> going back. Not OK. How about someone not recently graduated from high school mm-hmm. going straight into college? They've done some. I'm sure you're going to tell us that non-traditional can mean some other things like. Well, I don't know. Would a person that takes a gap year or two or three, would they be considered a non-traditional student? I don't know. I mean, you did a good job. Really good. So, of course, you're also right. I'm going to, you know me. You know, <laughs> you know I'm going to throw some more nuance in there. <laughs> so, uh, so you were good on that part, too. You got that part right, too. Okay. So the National Center for Educational Statistics, NCES, great government organization that I love, with great information. They note there are varying definitions of non-traditional students. But non-traditional students are typically contrasted with traditional students. What is a traditional student? One, someone who earns a high school diploma. Two, someone who enrolls full-time, this is your point, immediately after finishing high school. Mm -hmm. Three, someone who depends on parents for financial support. Mm -hmm. And four, someone who either does not go to work during the school year, or if they do go to work, they go part-time. So mm. no, that was pretty close to what you said, don't you think, Anika? Okay. I, I didn't know I was a non-traditional student. That's interesting. I just had a Oh, revelation. you mean when you went? Yeah. 
So you had you had a- I went part time. You went part time the whole time. Not well, yeah, for the most right part. From the start. Like not if from you the start. Start out full time and then go part time. You're not not mm-hmm. traditional, but did you? You started out as a part timer. No, I started out. I did, I think I did one full time semester, then I went straight to work, and then I went part time. Okay. So that's not non traditional. Mm, that's in that gray area because you started out full time. <laughs> I'm, I'm great non traditional. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> 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 and you also went, you also like went at 18 or 19 too. You didn't go older, right? Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So technically I would say that's not non-traditional. Okay. Um, I'm great. Yeah, it's okay. Monday, it's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Besides, I don't want to call you names over there. You might get mad at me. Mm-mm, I'm great. I'm good. <laughs> You're good now. You got that degree. That right. <laughs> right. Facts, facts, facts. So the NCES categorized anyone who satisfies at least one of the fault. Fo- following is non-traditional so actually let's put you through the test okay okay one delay enrollment does not enter post-secondary education in the same calendar year that he or she finished high school you you checked that box didn't you You didn't delay enrollment no did not delay correct okay look number two attends as a part-time student for at least part of the academic year oh yeah because you only went one semester full-time you said Mm -hmm. right or one year yeah yep that's right yeah, so you would have been a traditional student. Yeah, okay. according to the NCS defini- definition. Number three, works full time as defined by at least thirty five hours or more per week while enrolled. Mm-hmm. Yes or no? Forty plus. <laughs> really, for your whole time going through? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, you're such a hard worker. Mm. You must have been burning a midnight oil. I was working the midnight oil. I worked their shit. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Mm. Number four is considered financially independent for the purpose of determining eligibility for financial aid. Yep. Well, no. You're not just considered financially independent because you're making financially independent hours. Why not? Why would you say you were considered financially independent? Because I supported myself. That's not how financial aid is determined. We're going to get more into that. When oh, we get into that chapter. buddy. How yeah, I have there's a. a whole, <laughs> there's a whole series of tests that are used to determine whether you're a dependent or an independent student. Hmm. And and people like to be. In fact, we're going to be talking about that coming up a little bit real soon, but not you particularly. So mm-hmm. let's just say for now, you will. Trust me, you don't meet the definition just because you work full time. Like, yeah, you might have been independent, but that's not the financial definition of what an independent is. From the standpoint of FAFSA and financial aid. Okay. Number five. Has dependents other than a spouse. Usually children, but may also be caregivers of sick or elderly family members. Hmm, okay. Yes or no on that No, one? no, yeah. no dependents. No, Jalen you know. came after. <laughs> okay. Right, right so after. You okay, so you were good there. Mm-hmm. Number six. Is a single parent either not married or married but separated and has dependents. No, it wasn't that nope. deep. Mm-mm. Nope, nope, not that deep. And number seven, does not have a high school diploma, completed high school with a GED or other completion certificate, but um, did not finish high school. I did have a diploma, yes. Yeah, so the only one that kind of got you in that category was that you were part-time for part of your first year. So you're just... Yeah. And me Fair. disputing the fact that I was independent. <laughs> yeah, so you no, you sound like you don't believe me. I don't. <laughs> okay. I wish we could jump right ahead to that chapter, but it's coming up. We're coming up on that one. We're going to have a whole section on, you know, what's an independent versus a dependent student by the Department of Education standards for financial aid. Not because people do that all the time. They're like, they don't want because what happens when you're an independent, you don't have to show your parents financial information as part of the finan- of the evaluation. Mm-hmm. So people say that all the time. They're like, you know what? What if my kid moves out and they get in an apartment and they work? Can I declare them as dependent and not have to submit my financial information? See, that's one of those scams that anyway, let me not get ahead. Though. Just <laughs> stay tuned for that for that discussion. Everybody. Advice for those non traditional students. <laughs> Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. 
I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually it will be a college related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that 5000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. So, so Anika, take a guess. What percentage of students do you think are considered traditional versus non-traditional? Um, I think it's a lot more non-traditional than we think. Um, I'm just going to put my eggs in a basket. I feel like they're a lot more than what we think they are. You want to guess? Um, I'm going to say 35%. So according to the NCES definition, 73% of all undergraduates what? in two th- Yes, in in 2000, were considered non-traditional. What? 73% representing newly typical undergraduate. And guess what? This has this they did the test again in 04, same number, 08, 70, well, 04 wow. was 72, 08 it was 72 and then in 2012 it was 74. So that's what made me think we need to talk about this because we don't really I mean, we're called your college bound kid, right? Where most of our stuff is targeted to the eighteen-year-old going off, living in a dorm, all that. Hmm. Okay. I thought that was high too. That's very high. But okay. now the breakdown is: this is all NCS data. It depends, right? So forty-nine percent of these students were considered dependent by IRS standards. I mean, by Department of Education standards, fifty-one percent independent. Twenty-eight percent had dependents. Seventy-two no dependents. Fifteen percent. Uh, were single with a dependent, 85% single with no dependent. This is of these people that were independent. Like this is a breakdown of the people that were non-traditional. 91% high school grads, 90% just had a GED equivalency. 66% delayed post-secondary enrollment less than a year. 34% delayed post-secondary enrollment for more than a year. 57 full-time, 43% part-time. And then 26% worked full-time, 36% worked part-time, and 38% did not work at all. What, any, anything about those stats that grabbed you? Mm, no, I'm still stuck on the 73%. <laughs> my number. <laughs> I, Darn. I knew that number was going to. Now, I want to say this because, because there, there are some slight different definitions of independent. I'm sorry, of, of a non-traditional. So according to... Another really good website, College Scorecard, uh, 40% of undergraduate students are at least 24. Uh, but once again, that we read many different ways you could be considered non-traditional besides just being 24, right? So it's not like those two are necessarily conflicting with one another. Like, I mean, we proved it right there. You work part-time. You go to school part-time in your first year, according to the NCES definition. So I think it's a broader definition. Um, a non-traditional student is someone who doesn't match the above picture of a traditional incoming student. Young, just finished high school in the last year or two. Um, many non-traditional students, though, also have different life experiences, Anika. Uh, military veterans, mm-hmm. non-traditional, right? Missionaries, right. non-traditional. What about this one? Health concerns. Had to delay school because of some serious health concerns. Mm, right, yeah. You know, non-traditional, all right? Um, married children of any age, uh, of course. Um, so lots of different stripes there. I don't know if these non-traditional students are working okay. students, if they're working during the day, so they need to take nighttime class, you know, no, have, you know, more accommodating schedules. Correct. Um, probably one of the biggest ones, flexible scheduling. And yeah. Part-time, part-time schedules or flexible scheduling. What I don't know. That? That's, the, that's the only thing I can think of. Okay. Well, those are, that's one of the biggies. Um, some others are, uh, they may need help with housing. 
you know? And so if you're in, a, if you're in a mission office and you're trying to cater to non-traditional students, you might need to help them out with housing because housing could be a real concern for them because they don't want to be in a traditional dorm. Typically you don't want to be, right, you, know, right. you can't be in a traditional dorm if you're like with a kid. Right. right. So do you have for housing to that's sensitive to their needs? Mm, okay. Um, what about financial advising that's set, customized to their needs? Hmm. Uh, flexibility and application deadlines. Really what I'm giving you, Anika, is a list of what some of the schools that are really sensitive to non-traditional students, uh, some of the things that they do really, really well. Okay. Here's one. Let's say, you know, we're kind of focusing almost on like the 22, 24, maybe 20-year-old. What if you're like the 36 year old? Right? Right. Some schools will supplant the requirement of you having a teacher recommendation. In other words, try to go back and find your teacher from 20 years ago. And they'll let you use like a professional recommendation from a job in, in place of your academic, in place of your teacher rec. Okay. I mean, doesn't that make sense if you're trying to be sensitive to. Yeah, it does. You know, it is. Good luck trying to get the. To get a person to go find Dr. Jack or Dr. Jill, they may not even be around anymore. Right, exactly. Another thing is flexibility when it comes to test scores. So some schools will waive test scores requirements and some schools will say, no, you need to go take the SAT like right now at age 45, you know? So everybody's different. Um, another thing is child support, uh, child care support, because that could be a big deal. You got kids trying to do school. Do you offer some type of child care? Okay. And then another one is aggressive recruitment of community colleges. So that's one thing you'll find, like schools that really are catering to non-traditional will really step up their efforts to recruit community colleges. Okay. Um, and one other thing I'll say is that many college programs offer special events that kind of bring the community together with special circumstances to make the non-traditional student feel included. So just like affinity groups. Uh, social events for non-traditionals, things so they won't feel uh, as isolated and have a greater sense of community. There are a lot of colleges, a, co a lot of really selective colleges that have very special programs designed for the non-traditional students. They have admission officers and your title is, and your role exclusively is recruiter of non-traditional students. Um, Smith College, Ada Comstock program is off the chain. It's amazing. Mount hmm. Holyoke's got a great program. Vassar, Wesleyan, and Dartmouth, they've reached out and targeted military students uh, through the Posse Veterans Program, where they bring in a cohort of 10 veterans every year. Hmm. And then you have the famous uh, RU program at Brown, which stands for Resumed Undergraduate Education. You've got the Eli Whitney Students Program at, at Yale. You've got the Columbia General Studies Program. Tufts has a, a program with the acronym REAL, R-E-A-L. It stands for Resumed Education for Adult Learning. And then NYU has a School of Professional Studies in the Paul McGee Division. It's a unique program. Check this out. Anika. It actually gives you college credit for having some non-academic real life experience. So you have to like mm. submit your, you know, like your resume and they'll evaluate your your life experience and actually give you some college credit for it. So okay. um, those are some of the things that are out there for non-traditional students. Any thoughts on uh on any of those uh, programs or any of the things they're doing there. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. Okay, Mark. So through all of that, so what, you know, we always talk about big takeaways. So what are the big takeaways for our non-traditional students? What, what well, would they be? And so, so one of them I think is knowing that you're actually the majority, not the minority. Mm, I mean, that helps, right? I think that helps. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing I want to say is that don't give up on your education just because you didn't like do the go right to college, live in the dorm out, out of high school and think, okay, I guess college education didn't work out for me. Like there are schools that love non-traditional students and there's schools that cater to you. Hmm. And so, so that would be the first thing, like don't give up getting your education and then don't think, oh, like sometimes people think, well, I'm not going to live in a dorm I and mean, they're not going to understand my situation. Like, Right. There actually are. There's support groups out there. There's schools that actually studied what your needs are and they've catered their whole programs 
hmm. um, to you. And there's schools that really value you and see you as diversity on their campus. And hmm. and and so I think the biggest one is that like two things I would say, uh, don't give up hope of getting an education Two, know that there are people out there that have very customized programs for you. Um, and then I would say three, it would be do your research to find those programs. Like, don't just settle like, oh, OK, I guess I have to go to school around the corner. Hmm. Those would be my. And it, and within that research, is that something like you said, they have, I, I, which I would have never realized or known that they have specific programs just for non-traditional students. So is that something like you if you go to a website, you say, oh, we've got study abroad. We've got 25 undergraduate programs and oh, we've got a non-traditional something, something, something. Is that something that's there or is that a conversation with an admissions person? It's a great question. So. Um, what I would say is more often than you're not, you're not going to go to an admission site and see somebody with a title like, you know, director of non-traditional student program. You're not mm-hmm. going to necessarily find that title. You, that title is out there, but mm-hmm. that's going to be more the exception than the norm. Right. So uh, what I would say is that that's an absolute great question to ask the admission office and say, is there one of the great question is, do you have anybody that specializes in working with non-traditional students? That's a good question. Okay. Um, and just because they say no, I wouldn't necessarily rule them out because some schools are smaller, different budgets, blah, blah, blah. Right. right. But then I would at least follow up and say, what type of specific programs um, do you have or in which ways are you sensitive to the non-traditional um, college student experience? Because I'm looking at this view book, whatever I'm seeing is 18 year old, 20 year old all the time. That's not necessarily me. So what programs uh, do you have that would be, you know, designed for somebody like myself? Oh, my goodness. Mark, if I'm 35, do I have to go back and take the SAT or the ACT? Some schools like Stanford, you know, I just got back from there. They make you go back no matter how. Oh, and actually, we had a panel of non-traditional students when we were there. Really? Some of, some of them were, yeah, because they wanted to show that we're an option for that. They're an hmm. option for that. And some of them were in their 30s. And one guy did have to go back and have to take the test because, you know, oh. so. But that's a that's Stanford. Like not that's remembered. One of the things that I said is flexibility with test scores is one of the things that sometimes. Nika, was it that painful? Or you just, yeah. <laughs> I think I've had a recur. Like, no. Bruises and memories and scars from. I, I say, feel like, like I've had this recurring nightmare. Ago, right? No, no, no. Yeah. I feel like I've had this recurring nightmare about taking some tests when I was in college, and I found out later that I didn't really pass it, so I didn't really graduate. And all this time, I didn't know. So that kind of brought all that out of me. So I don't, oh yeah, test taking. So is that nightmare <laughs> like? Is it like a true story, or is it like just like a figment of your imagination? Not trying to get into your test score life, but just wondering. right now it's a figment. However, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. All right. For this week's question segment, we're going to do a little bonus episode, Mark. Um, And so way back, y'all, on episode 21, we had our first breaking news uh, when University of Chicago um, made the big announcement that they were going test optional. Um, And that was a big, really big deal um, because they're one of the most well-known and prestigious institutions in the country. So here we are almost a year later and we, you know, Mark, you've talked about the test optional movement and all that's going on there. And the fact that university of Chicago did this, what in the world has transpired since that major announcement is what are we right around a year later now, somewhere around there. Yeah. So I'm just doing the math myself and Nika, this is episode 80 and that was 21. So that's 59 weeks. So 52 weeks would be a year. So a month Mm -hmm. and a year, two months, two months since we did that, you know, um, a lot has happened, Anika, and what has happened is that the test optional movement has picked up on steroids. Mm. It, it has picked up, you know, at, at, at a pretty significant rate. There have been forty-one colleges to go test optional since that decision. Since since over the last year. Yes, forty-one. So wow. I know. Yeah, and and what's interesting about it is it's the kind of colleges that have done it. So one thing that is oftentimes not talked about. When when the test optional, you know, you quote the test optional movement, right? You say over a thousand colleges now are test optional, which is true. Um, but one thing that's not mentioned that much, especially by the test optional advocates, a lot of those colleges are what we call open admission, open enrollment colleges. So it's surprising to a lot of people, but a lot of those over one thousand colleges are open enrollment colleges. 
Mm, um, okay. Do you remember what that was from your past reading or our past conversations? Well, so the open enrollment, I know it. It's just you apply, you get accepted, right? Like they like they don't deny. Do GED, yeah, you do just. GED. Yeah. Okay. So, so a lot of the schools fall in that category, right? And so, just to be perfectly honest, that's why one reason why I was a big deal. Um, now, don't get me wrong. There's a huge mixture because you've got Bowdoin, one of the most selective schools in the country. They're now celebrating their 50th year of test optional. Bates, highly selective, 35th year, right? Mm. And you've had many in the last 10, 12 years, from the George Washingtons to the Wake Forest to. Um, even some big state schools. So it's not only that, but I'm just saying the majority have been non-selective. Right. One of the things that's happened since you Chicago did when is they've kind of given cover to other schools. Um, Cause you've always had schools like Smith is a test optional school, you know, that have been highly selective that have gone it, but there's always been a little reticence that are you sending a message that you're not that rigorous? In other words, there have been schools that have wanted to go test optional, but they've been kind of afraid that they wouldn't send the right message to their prospective students. Hmm. Does that make any sense or not? Yeah, it does. But clearly, University of Chicago <laughs> wasn't worried about that. So why should they be? Well, the point is, so so University of Chicago is giving them cover. So like Colby College is test optional, highly selective college. Um, back in February, Bucknell. I mean, these are all schools that have broken very, you know, in the last year, year and a half. Right. Colby came out right away after Chicago. Bucknell came out in February. Test optional. Now you have a bunch of others. Um, Modern selectivity. Creighton, DePaul, Fairley Dickinson, Ferris State, Evergreen State. All went test optional. University of Denver. Uh, really a hot school on the move. They went test optional not that long ago. Hmm. Um, Minnesota at Crookston went. And then. A string of announcements came out. The University of San Francisco, one of the more recent ones. And I was with the University of San Francisco admissions rep. I'll be talking more about that in a coming up podcast mm-hmm. uh, when I was out in, in California, because uh, I think I might have told you. But it was a Stanford event. But we spent nine hours the last day with six reps from six different colleges, including San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And so they made the big announcement and they talked about it at length there. And so and then Springfield College went and. Uh, This is a quote I'm going to read from an article in Inside Higher Ed. It says, in calendar year 2019, the pace is now one such announcement every 10 days, more than (laughs) twice the pace at comparable points in past years, said Robert Schaefer, Public Education Director of Fair Test, National Center for Fair and Open Testing, a group that perhaps the leading critic of standardized testing in college admissions. Colleges will frequently consult with fair test in advance of announcing a shift. And the organization Mm -hmm. keeps a watch list of colleges that have consulted with it publicly and say they are considering making such a shift. So, you know, so they keep this list of people that consult with them. Like, let me tell us talk about this. Like, what's this going to look like? Hmm. And so this list consulting with fair test is now has more than 30 colleges on it. Okay. And and the use of fair test database of test optional colleges has jumped more than 25%. So they can check how many people are doing online searches. And that's like sky high off the charts, right? Hmm. So now some of it is since the scandal broke out, right? So that hasn't helped either because we talked a lot about that, Anika, the Mr. I call Mr. Side Door Hustle Varsity Blues, mm-hmm. right? Now all the test shenanigans going on with testing, right. that definitely, you know, led more scrutiny. And here's the big thing. And this came up when I was out in California as well from the university of Berkeley was one of the schools that did a presentation. And after university of San Francisco got up and said, great news, everybody we're test optional in 2020. And a lot of people like that. And then they said, what about you, Cal Berkeley? You know, from one of Hmm. the counselors asked that. And the director of admission from Cal Berkeley was there. And he said that there's a system wide faculty committee at University of California and they're studying right now oh whether to go test optional. They that would be the bombshell of bombshells if they go. <laughs> they are, you, know, you know how big the University of California system is? I mean, I can only imagine. I mean, that's not just Berkeley. That's Davis. That's Irvine. That's San Diego. That's Santa Barbara. That's LA. It's just is and others. There's many, many, many schools in there. It's a boatload of kids. 
so this happened in one year. What are we looking like five years from now? Is my school going to go test optional? You think? I don't know. You 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 know your college better than I do. <laughs> you ask me that question. <laughs> I don't think I don't know. So, <laughs> I don't think I do. So wow. So it's now. There are some people who feel like and we talked about this on the podcast or two ago, Nika, maybe three, four, five, that. This is, of course, why the, you know, SAT uh, unleashed the environmental context dashboard. Uh, I talked Mm -hmm. to a very, very prominent leader from a school tell me that was the smartest thing they ever did. And they just kept so many schools from going test optional. But because that's the whole point that they're coming back and acknowledging. Now you can look at test scores in context because that's always been the knock against them. Right. Mm -hmm. There's so many things they don't take into consideration um, and they're overused. And so, but I'll be honest with you, when I, when, when the college board released the ECD, at first I thought that was going to stem the test optional movement. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that was going to stem the, you know, this alacrity at which schools are going test optional, but I don't, I think it has too much steam. That's not going to be a panacea, Nika. I do think yeah, it's going to keep some schools. No question. But hmm. all indications are, it will continue. Here's another quote. Inside Higher Ed did a poll of admission leaders la- last fall, and they said a majority believe that Chicago's decision is going to influence other schools. Further, 17% of the leaders said that Chicago's shift was prompting their decision to rethink their priorities. Uh, the hmm. survey also showed many of these admission leaders are concerned Um, about the trends in test scores uh, by ethnicity. Generally, colleges that have dropped testing requirements and admissions have reported gains in increasing their diversity while at the same time not lowering their graduation rates. In other words, they've been able to still graduate the same number of kids. And by the way, another huge announcement that came out, uh, Anika, Mm -hmm. was Rochester. That's another really, really prestigious school that announced that they're going test optional. And well, listen, this is Mark. This is what I need. If whoever's going to do it, can you give some flags or some smoke signals or something? Because we're on the other side over here paying for this test prep and going through these hours of all this stuff. And I don't. Wait a minute, Nika. You're being very, very what? modest over there. You have a daughter what? that's in the top five, maybe five to ten percent of test takers in the country. I know what her scores are. I'm not going to put your name. Now I'm not going to put your name yeah. out on on blast, but you know, she might, no, kudos, but test scores congratulations, are way, way, way over national averages. Shout out to Janae, but Marco, you know, when I speak for me, I speak for all of us parents on this podcast listening. Like we are, si- but that will still work. We still had to pay for that. I mean, just imagine if she would have done that, and then next year the school's like, oh, we're test optional now. I would be fired. Listen. Mm, well, I don't know. The thing. I don't know until everybody else knows. Like announcements get made. I don't have any like secret genie magic sauce to know when it's going to happen. It but is. still, I mean, I'm just saying that's something to consider. These kids are working hard getting ready for these tests. I know. But now well, here's one thing to think about, Anika. There's still the majority of schools and especially the majority of selective schools require the test. And there are a lot that have no plans on changing that either. Uh, so it's well, extremely I risky don't know. to do that. Now, if I'm working with someone who's extremely low tester. There are enough test optional mm-hmm. schools out there now that I can build your entire college list off test optional schools. But right. if you say, hey, I really, really like school X, Y, Z, and they're not test optional, for you to say, well, I'm just going to take a chance they go test optional, that would be foolhardy. Because normally, the announcement will come out like for the following year. Like, this is done in advance. Right, 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 right. right. Some grace period. Yeah. Gotcha. So listen, here's a quote from Rochester, which I thought was fascinating. Since 2011, the admissions policy has been to be test flexible, where applicants didn't need to take the SAT or ACT, but they needed to at least submit some form of standardized testing. Most often, they would submit AP tests, sometimes IB tests, or sometimes other national and international exams to be considered for admission. The VP for Enrollment Initiatives and the Dean of Admissions, Jonathan Burdick, says that under the test flexible policy, hundreds of well-qualified students who never took the SAT or ACT, they enrolled and the high selectivity, retention, and graduation rates over the past decade indicate that this approach is well-founded. During our test-flexible years, we also discovered 
that optional standardized tests added very little to our review process, says Burdick. Even the well-constructed tests don't lead to better decisions, and they cost, and it comes at a cost to the students. This is what you were talking about. Having to take and submit those extra exams outweighs any benefit to us. The burden has been greatest on our first generation and our low-income students with exceptional high school grades and low scores, as they have been enrolling and they have been succeeding here. We know that other applicants denied based in part on lower test scores may have also thrived here. And we want all high achieving students to have equivalent opportunity at Rochester. Let me tell you another reason why that's uh, noteworthy is because the schools that are the most test score oriented tend to be your math science schools. And Rochester Mm -hmm. is a powerhouse in STEM. And so when you see STEM schools like WPI, Worcester Polytech, and Rochester going test optional, that's like, that's powerful. The other thing that you don't see that often, Anika, is large public schools going test optional. It tends to be the smaller schools. But guess what? Very recently, Indiana State said they're going test optional. University of New Hampshire Mm. going test optional. These are larger universities. So the thing about the test optional movement now is it's it's no longer just the one-offs that are selective or just the small schools. You're finding a lot more highly selectives, a lot more larger schools, and and more public schools kind of hitting every single sector. Hmm. What do you think? Well, I say we do this again in about... 20 more episodes. And see. 20? <laughs> I mean, we got to give at least a year and a half. I don't know. I feel like it's snowballing. No, I'll I'll just, tell you okay, 30, I'll tell 35, you this. 35, 35. I'll tell you this. <laughs> so I've been having a debate now for about three years with one of my really good friends in the profession, a steam colleague, and we worked together in the past. And so we know it's just a matter of time before one of the eight Ivy League schools goes test optional. And mm. so we've been having this debate, which one is going to do it first? Oh, wow. And That's my, be I've been betting on Brown because Brown is just always has been just kind of progressive and outside the box. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my friend thinks it's going to be Dartmouth because uh, Lee Coffin, their director of admission, came from Connecticut College where they went test optional. And so uh-huh. they had and it was very successful. So they think that, so, you know, so we'll see. For all I know, it'll be like, you know, I can't see Penn doing it. And after coming back from Harvard, I don't see them doing it. Um, Mm -hmm. So who knows who is going to be, but it is going to happen. Like if I was a betting person, I would bet a tremendous amount of money that in the next five years, one of the IBs will go test optional. Mm. Well, one of y'all gonna have to buy the other one dinner. That's that's the bet. (laughs) Steak dinner (laughs) with some shrimp in there. (laughs) You know what? I will say this, though. I'm not anti-test score, Anika. Like, for all of this, I I love it when schools go test optional, but I understand why they don't. It does provide, I will say this, a kid that gets a 1,500 SAT in a straight A's is a different kid than a kid that gets a 900 on the SAT in straight A's. It is Mm -hmm. is different in, in terms of their... um level of which their skills have been developed at this point. And that can be useful when you're in a super competitive admission pool, or you have a really, really, really hard school and you've done research. This is the one thing that I ask, do the research and only keep the test. If your research indicates that it does a good job of predicting Rochester did the research and found it didn't do a good job. There are schools Mm -hmm. that have done research and found that it predicts fairly well. And for those schools, so I don't want people to think that I'm in the camp of like all these bad people offering tests because I don't think that's fair. Okay, we'll see. 35 episodes from now. (laughs) We have to negotiate that one. I want to (laughs) bore people. We've already done it twice. Mm -mm, I need to know what's going on out there. I can just privately tip you off when somebody goes, you know. No, we got to let everybody know. Got to let everybody do it. We'll do it in small talk. It's fine. We'll keep it short. So, you know what? (laughs) I'll say this. How about like when we when we get 50 more schools to go or or a bombshell school? Either one. Okay. Bombshell. I'll take bombshell. Gotcha. (laughs) Check, check. (sighs) And now this week's interview with a special guest. Okay, listening family, very exciting. This is the first time we have one of our listeners who reached out to us 
shared an amazing idea, and now is being interviewed. And that listener would be Daniel Green, who is my guest, our guest today on the Your Cloud Bound Kid for the interview. And Daniel's going to start out. He's going to talk about um, his college experience growing up and what he's doing now in life, which is very different than what he went to school for, which I think people will find interesting. And then he's going to transition and talk about some next level stuff, how our community can work together and help each other. And one thing I really love is he's going to make a special free offer to all of our listeners that I think you guys are going to love. And it's going to really help you, particularly if you have a senior. Hint, hint, Anika. I think you're going to love this one. And then he's going to explain the Trello app. What is it? How does he use it? How does his wife use it? How does his son use it? And he's going to give us some powerful examples of how we can use it. So listen and enjoy. I am here with Daniel Green from Elkton, Maryland. Welcome to the Your College Bound Kid podcast, Daniel. Hey, thanks for having me on, Mark. Oh, this is exciting. And and I think it's really cool how we met, Dan. So why don't you just let our listeners know how the two of us met? It's a little different than most of our interviewees we have on the show. Yeah, well, let me take you back to last summer. So my son, Josh, uh, was just completing his sophomore year. And like a lot of parents who are excited about the college process, we were getting a lot of mail. And all of a sudden, I was thinking, okay, I need to get smart about how college admissions works. And I think, like a lot of the listeners as well, I Googled everything and talked to just about everyone about college admissions and quickly found out there is way too much information out there and <laughs> and it wasn't consolidated and you know what i felt overwhelmed so now in my job i have a pretty long commute to my office so i thought wouldn't it be cool if there was a podcast out there where somebody could actually consolidate this information present it in a concise way and i stumbled upon your podcast and I can tell you, once I heard you and Anika the first time, I was hooked. I'm pretty sure. In, in fact, I think I emailed you like the same day with a question. And like to your credit, you responded right away. And, and really, since then, uh, you and I have exchanged emails quite frequently. Yeah, that's great. And, and I tell you, of all the interviewees we've had uh, in talking with Anika, I think this was the one she was most excited about. So the idea of actually having a listener come on and share something that will be, uh, I'm confident, uh, of great value to the rest of our listeners. It's just kind of exciting because it's sort of the idea, rather than just sort of a, a Nika and I here as the ones who are sort of bestowing information, it's sort of more of the idea of a collective shared community. So pretty invigorating. So Daniel, take a little time to tell us a little bit about your bio so we have a you know better sense of who you are. Sure. So I'm a principal consultant at Attain as in attain your goal. Uh, attain is a leading management and technology firm. It's out of the Washington DC area. So we support the federal government and even work with some colleges and universities. Some things that we do in my business is a lot of business transformation, cybersecurity, working with organizations on their strategies. It's a lot of fun for me and I really enjoy it. Personally, I live in Maryland, although I grew up in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A uh, lifelong Steelers fan for all the <laughs> listeners out there. And I know there's a good community of uh, black and gold people. I live with my uh, wife and uh, two kids. Uh, as I mentioned, Josh, uh, he's a rising senior. And my daughter, Scarlett, well, she's about to enter the eighth grade. Uh, the last thing I'll share is really as a family, we, we love traveling. Uh, we all stay active. And uh, one of our, our loves is watching old Harry Potter movies together. So uh, we uh, have a lot of fun, work hard, and certainly enjoy time. That's great. And, and I'll throw one more thing in because, you know, you know, Dan, you, you and I have had a few different exchanges, and I, I know you've shared Josh's uh, list of colleges. And at one point, you know, you were sharing some colleges with me, and I saw our sinus on there. And I got really happy because uh, I've always felt our sinus is one of these really, really underrated schools that not a lot of people know about. And then uh, you didn't throw this in there, but it turns out uh, you're actually your inner sinus graduate, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I graduated back in 1994, which makes me on the older side of life. But uh, yeah, I loved every moment at her sinus. It, uh, one of the great things about that school is when you talk about critical thinking, 
and that important skill at a liberal arts college, that was something that uh, I really grew into. I think when I arrived at Ursinus, I really didn't know what I wanted to do and ended up majoring in English um, and really just enjoyed the experience of working with other smart people and then ultimately, uh, you know, graduating in four years. And tell us a little bit about your dad. I think he's, he's kind of fascinating, too, and the role he had. Oh, yeah. So my father was a, a statistician, retired now, but he taught at uh, American University for almost 20 years, statistics and you know, general mathematics. So uh, as I was making my college rounds and trying to you know, decide which school I would attend, he, he would offer some nice tidbits of things like, you know, look for schools where only teaching assistants are, are in the classroom or look for class size and various things that were very instrumental in making me think through the right criteria for me. Now, did you mean where teaching assistants are only in the classroom or they're not in the classroom? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So classes where you don't have professors teaching, where the, the emphasis was so much about research that you only had TAs there. He, he, he really frowned upon that and thought that that wouldn't be a good experience for me. Yeah. I mean, most people are, are paying their money for the, the seasoned pro, not the grad assistant getting a PhD. You know? Definitely. So let's jump to our topic of the day. Um, so this is exciting. So we're going to talk about how to use Trello which is a project management app uh, to help you stay organized in the college admission process. And just a little bit of background on this. So um, our regular listeners know I have a recommended resource of the week every podcast, and I was actually researching a number of apps to, to share as a recommended research, a recommended resource. And I had just been looking at Trello. And then Daniel sends me this email saying, you know, I'd like to share a, an app that I really think could help the listener. So I, I just think it was meant to be, and the timing was perfect. And um, Diana, why don't, you, Diana, why don't you kick it off and tell us more about Trello and share, you know, share what it is about Trello that made you decide to use it and help you and in, in Josh in your college process. Absolutely. So let me go back again to last summer. Uh, I started to engage Josh in, you know, conversations around colleges and admissions and just his general thoughts about, you know, what his interest would be. And to be very frank with you, Mark, the conversations were not going well. Uh, You're, not became pretty stressful. You're not alone. You're not alone. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He felt it wasn't like he was under a heat lamp, but at times he did. He felt like, Dad, you're interrogating me. Or why are you asking so many questions? I'm just starting my junior year. So uh, put it this way. We just weren't clicking in the beginning. So from that, I decided, you know, I needed to find a, a better way, to really have conversations with him. And uh, I thought about Trello because that has been a tool that I've used in business for quite some time. Um, and it really saved the day. I'll be very frank with you. So uh, let me go ahead and give you a background about Trello. Uh, in simple terms, I think for the listeners, uh, just imagine like a large whiteboard in your office. And you have basically put sticky notes all over the whiteboard with activities. So you take that idea and put that online on a website. And that's the visual there. So essentially, uh, what you do is you take a project and you basically apply sticky notes online. And you can move them around and you can decide how you want to manage that project. Um, I can tell you I've been using it for many years. Uh, a really good example, if I may, yeah, uh, in how to do it outside of the college world is uh, think about buying a car. You know, that can also be a stressful situation. Well, imagine the ability to to really capture all the activities around buying that car in one location. So everything, including like, you know, visiting dealerships, test driving cars getting financing, trade-in. So essentially, you, you put all this information inside of Trello, and then you can then decide you know, what information you want to store, what notes you want to include. So if you had a conversation with a car salesperson, put the notes in there. If you received a quote, upload the quote. And what's really cool about Trello, too, is you can do all this from a computer or from a phone there's a nice app that goes with it. So 
in terms of this, though, let me sort of pivot to uh, the college admission side. Uh, with Trello, essentially, you're going to create this board called college admissions. Um, and before I forget, let me tell you, this is all free. Uh, there's no 30-day trial or anything like that. You can use Trello without a cost forever, essentially. Nice. Um, and so back to the idea of you create this board, this whiteboard, and call it college admissions. And, and on that board, you create these lists, like a, a to-do list, uh, maybe a list that says what I'm doing and a list that says what I've done. And, and then it's basically like think about a workflow, a workflow pardon me, that you go between these particular lists. And you basically move these sticky notes or what Trello calls cards from one list to another. So you can create lists based off of categories like college tours planned, college tours scheduled, college tours completed. Um, that's another way to do it. And really what happens is you add these activities. So say for like college admissions, going back to this general theme. Mm -hmm. Um, you might have cards that say sign up for SAT, uh, ask Mrs. Smith for a recommendation letter, uh, discuss senior year schedule. And then basically within each one of these, these cards, uh, you can add a due date, you can create checklists, you can assign cards to you or your child. Uh, and really, once you start working on these cards, these activities, again, you can move them from one list to another. Uh, does that help visualize this whole concept of Trello, Mark? Not only does it help, I can tell you, you either inherited your dad's genes as a, as a college professor or, or you're, you're just a natural because I think the whiteboard illustration was extremely helpful. I think the carbine illustration was also really helpful. And I, I really like how you related it to the college process. And um, listeners, I will also let you know that uh, Dan did a demo for me as well, because I personally did not have not used Trello before I'd been researching it, but hadn't used it. And, um, you know, really, really, really impressive stuff. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. The recommended resource for episode 80 is the book, He's Not Lazy. Subtitled, Empowering Your Son to Believe in Himself by Adam Price. Uh, great book by Adam Price. What he does is he looks at how boys are just overwhelmed right now by all the demands that they face, and they just can't handle it. They can't handle the pressure cooker environment. And many bright and many capable boys, they feel ineffective. And they, they instead of working harder and taking on the challenge, they sort of mask the um, lack of confidence that they are experiencing and the out of control sentiments that are illuminating in their mind, ruminating in their mind, and they end up using more avoidance tactics and denial tactics as coping mechanisms. And Adam believe Adam Price believes that technology has created a lot of this problem overwhelmed and being overstimulated and boys feeling more pressure than ever and he feels a lot of this pressure is because the college prep process is starting too early the book argues that when you look at all the balls that boys are having a juggle right now it would require their brain to be as developed as a seasoned executive but price points out that new research shows that boys brains are not fully developed into their early or their mid 20s. So he talks about how boys experience more problems with ADD, ADHD than girls. But it's not an all bad news gloom and doom book because what he does is he talks about how boys can face their fears and how they can have hope. So our book of the week, He's Not Lazy, Empowering Your Son to Believe in Himself by Adam Price. We will now return to our interview with Daniel Green. So, so Dan, what do you consider the best features of, of Trello? Like, which ones do you find are most valuable and most helpful? Yeah, so why don't I give you a few of them that I really use regularly? So the first one, and I, I said it just a moment ago, is creating checklists within a card. So keeping it simple again, thinking about maybe college tours, what we would do is like I would create a card, say, visit State University. Mm -hmm. And then I'd create a checklist inside of that card, which said, 
uh, schedule the tour, book travel, attend the tour, and then summarize my experience. And each one of those you can check off as you complete them. So it really allows you to sort of take this this information and take them as necessary steps to complete this this overall activity. Um, it really helped Josh and me in, in understanding those key things to do for these college tours and really stick to it. Uh, the second feature, and I'll, I'll share this too, and it goes along with checklists, it is the ability to add documents mm. or emails to a card. So really what you can do is, you know, Everybody who signs up for a college tour, you typically get like a confirmation email where well, you can take that email and you can send it to the Trello board hmm. or you can just upload it as a PDF. There's lots of ways to do it. So you can keep all this information in context. And again, why that's really helpful is, you know, you can forget, hey, uh, did we actually sign up for this tour or not? Uh, what day is it? When is it? Uh, keep it all the information you're working on in one centralized location so that you and your child has access to it basically whenever you want. And, you know, one thing I really like about this, you know, so many times you hear in the college process, and you'll hear me say this if you listen regularly, student in the driver's seat, parent in the passenger seat, this is the student's process, let them own it. But then one of the questions becomes, well, then what is the role for parents? And one of the biggest roles for parents can be sort of that organizer, Uh, There's a lot of logistics and a lot of organization involved in this process, and that can be an absolute vital, instrumental role that that parents can play. Um, Why don't you talk a little bit about the breakdown between what you do with Trello versus what Josh does with Trello and kind of how that, you know, what roles, you know, each of you sort of assume in this process, uh, Dan? Yeah. Well, and and allow me to cite your previous interview with Josie, where she talked about, you know, helping your child get organized with college essays. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's the role that that I've assumed with Josh, kind of the organizer. Mm -hmm. So I really manage the board, the lists, some of these cards. And then what Josh has done is he really focuses on completing the activities and making updates. So when we meet to actually talk about college admissions, we always bring up the board in front of us. Mm -hmm. And then he and I exchange information. And I typically will be that scribe. But again, we work you know, together so that we make sure that the information that we want to keep in Trello, we're both comfortable with. I like it. So, so is there a role Trello can play to be of value to a family where maybe the student and the parent don't have as close a working relationship like you and Josh do? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, really, the tool makes it so easy to collaborate, but really a parent or a child could use this by themselves. Uh, You know, essentially, it's an organization tool to manage this whole process. So, you know, the way that we've done it has been very effective because other means weren't. But I would tell you this way, you know, I think once, once you start using it, either as a parent or a child, I think you'll find that it actually will bring you closer together in the process. Because I mentioned earlier that, you know, Trello alleviated many of those stressors that came with college admissions because Josh didn't feel like he was under that heat lamp and really felt like there was one common centralized place where we were on the same page. So what about your wife, Dan? Uh, Does she look at this? Does she just let this be you and Josh's thing? Is she involved at all? Does she log into the account? I mean, does she have any role at all to play in this? (laughs) It's kind of funny you mentioned that because at first she was like, I don't know Trello. I don't know what it is. I'm not interested. Right. She, she just rejected it out of just what are you putting me through? And that's not how I manage things. But, but really since then uh, she's gotten excited about it. I think one of the cool things that, that, that she discovered and uh, what got her hooked was um, the three of us went to go visit Georgetown together. And with the Trello app, uh, you can take notes in real time. So Josh and I would sit in the information session, you know, with the hundred other people in the room. And when something really interesting was said that maybe wasn't found in like a brochure or on their website, you know, we would take note of it right then and there within Trello. Mm. So, you know, my wife was looking at that like, well, that's pretty ingenious because trying to remember everything that was key from a tour 
is hard to do after the fact. But look at you guys. You 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 know you basically captured the essence of the entirety of their of this process just by paying attention and putting it in Trello in real time. So you sold her. You converted her. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'll say it this way: I think it's still a work in progress. But uh, she's a lot farther along than she was before. But, you know, I think that's great, though, because what it shows is, you know, everybody's a little different in terms of how they use technology, how organized they are. I mean, you're a project manager in your job. So this stuff is probably kind of second nature to you. Um, So I think it's helpful for people to hear how maybe a non-project manager type still can find value, you know, value to the tool. That's good. That's good. So let's talk about the person who's listening and says, I'm sold. I like what I'm hearing. Um, What are what are the next steps you recommend? And then why don't you also um, share a great offer that you that you suggested to me at the start before we came online, um, Dan, that I thought was fantastic. It's probably a good place to integrate that into our conversation as well. Sure. Yeah. So it's very easy to get started with Trello. So basically, just go to the website www.trello.com that's t-r-e-l-l-o uh, and they have a really nice getting started page it's right off the home page and essentially when you get to that getting started page they have a trello 101 video uh, which is just perfect it's very intuitive it helps you understand what it's about and how you use it really once you go through that video uh, sign up for that free account and start populating your board. Uh, So yeah, back to our earlier conversation, uh, I'm gonna create kind of a a test board, a sandbox where uh, your listeners can click the link and take a look at how uh, I've assembled Trello uh, so they can see the different possibilities. So there'll be examples up there to play with and uh, they can do whatever they want because I'll create another board in case people completely delete everything, which is fine. But, uh, for, you know, for those listeners out there, play around. Um, and if you have questions about it, uh, you can also email me. Um, and, and that would be fine because I'm happy to help anybody because it really has been helpful for me. And, and I, I really, really thank you for this. I'm, I'm very, very inspired by this. Uh, I know I, I said this at the start of our interview, but the thought of our, our podcast sort of going full circle from just, you know, Anika and I uh, sharing information to sort of our whole community pulling together and helping each other is kind of uh, next level stuff. And I think this whole interview and your offer right here um, embody that. So, so that, so I, I can't thank you enough. And, and, and listeners, friends of the show, we'll, we'll put that link in the show notes. Um, so just check the show notes and it'll, it'll be really clear. I know I have fooled around uh, with the link and uh, I really have liked a lot of what I've seen, or I wouldn't have had Dan come on today. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, awesome, awesome stuff. Well, our regular listeners, you know what time it is. Time to wind down. And that means it's time for Dang to be on the hot seat of our lightning round. And because you're a regular listener, I'm going to throw a couple curveballs at you. Are you ready? Bring it. <laughs> so so what did you learn from your own college process that you are applying to Josh's search? I think the best thing for me was uh, allowing my, my parents allowed me to make the ultimate decision. Mm. and they were more of guides, facilitators in the process and not dictating to me. So that's really helped me with Josh to help him, you know, come to his own conclusions and ultimately make the choice. Yeah. A lot of times when I'm meeting with the family, you know, I I say, I say, I'm not going and look to the parents and I say, you're not going. This is a student that's going in. And one reason why that's kind of emblazoned in my mind is um, I'm thinking of a, a student I worked with in New York some time ago where the parent kind of heavy handed the student and really sort of told them where they were going and it did not work out well. And it, it led to some lingering resentment. Um, I do know that different cultures are a little different. And so, um, you know, everybody has to kind of work that out as a family, how they're going to approach that. And I do believe that parents have the right to veto a school if it's either not affordable or if they truly believe that, um, you know, you're not going to let your kid run off the ledge. Um, You know, you are, there's a financial investment. So there's an aspect of this where it's both a joint decision from parent and student, but unless you strenuously object to what your child is saying, it's good to let them, um, this is one of the first major decisions they're going to make. It's nice not to kind of stifle 
stifle them and let them own it. So what is your favorite website when it comes to the college process? Wow, there's actually many that I enjoy. I think, you know, I got hooked on the ranking site first with like Niche and some others. Um, but I'll tell you, the, the sites that I spend the most time is going to the direct university sites and especially their, their student newspapers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think between Josh and me, we've looked at many of the papers to get really an inside look at what's happening. Uh, at the school. And it's really uh, allowed us both to ask some very tailored questions during the the tours. And so I highly recommend that too. And I think that came from one of your early podcasts about really, t- you know, taking a look at those student newspapers. Yeah. In fact, I remember you sent uh, sent me an email after after I mentioned that and talked about how helpful that was for you, particularly with uh, some of the New England liberal arts schools you were looking at. Um, I could not have had a better answer from you there on that one because, firstly, if someone asked me what my favorite website is, I boy, I'd be stifled. I'd be stumped. That's a really hard question. But um, I'm always trying to let people, you know, go to the website. You know, I, I say this over and over. Less than 1% of the students I work with spend enough time on the website and then the student newspapers. So uh, I almost feel like I planted you there. But really, listeners, I did not tell, tell Daniel these questions in advance. All right, next up, what is your favorite sport to watch or play? Uh, to watch is definitely football. I mentioned I'm a big-time Steelers fan. Uh, to play is, is basketball. Uh, I, I still play, but uh, as I'm getting a little older, I'm more sort of cognizant of not getting injured as much. So it, uh, the game is definitely below the rim at this age, but I still have a, a lot of fun playing it. Well, good for you. At least I, I didn't hear any 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 stories of, of of ACLs or Achilles tears there. So that's pretty good for a 1994 grad to to be injury free. Knock on wood. Thank you. <laughs> if you had to move to another country, where would you want to live? Uh, so my wife and I have talked about retiring in Italy. Oh, you're uh, ready for both of us were there 20 years ago uh, and just had the most wonderful experience. Good stuff. Good stuff. And I, this is a standard question I ask a lot of our guests, but it can become a real good source of information. So I'm going to go, go to one of my standard questions. If you, what are some of the best book? What's the best book or two you've read in the last few years? So I read a lot, uh, you know, a lot of business books, mm-hmm. which is just a, a passion of mine. So uh, there's two of them actually. One is called The Phoenix Project, hmm. which uh, is pretty well known. It talks a lot about. Um, technology and how you do things better. And the second one is a book called The Three Laws of Performance. And that really talks about how to get results. And I think we spend a lot of time in business uh, pining away at things, but not focused on outcomes. And that book really helps transform some of that thinking. Daniel, you survived the hot seat. This is, (laughs) (laughs) but most importantly, thank you so much uh, just for coming on the podcast for being a regular contributor. I know you're one of our, our donors to help us our costs. You, know, you email us regularly and you just kind of inspire me by all the work you're doing, you know, with your son and Josh and really, really grateful for, for you setting up this uh, template for, for people to be able to fool around and, and see how Trello can work for them. And then also for making your email available if, if people have additional questions. So um, thanks a lot and we'll be in touch. Thank you, Mark. Next week in the news, the admissions arms race, six ways colleges gain their numbers. And we'll be in chapter 81 of 171 Answers. And we're talking through some common mistakes made by international students applying to U.S. colleges. And next week's question is from a mom who wants to know if LinkedIn could be useful in the college application process. And Mark returns with Miss Chika Nwosu. She was our recent high school graduate. Um, she was on a previous episode. She we, she shared the beginning of her college experience or college search experience. So she's going to be back sharing her updates on her college admissions process. So, Anika, you know, I was at Stanford out there for five days going through this certification process they have for their. They brought in the 41 of us um, to get some additional professional mm-hmm. development. And. um you know, we spent a lot of time reading Stanford applications, actually, and getting feedback from the admission counselors to better understand how to read a file and how to send, basically how to send the right kid to Stanford, right, to understand them better. Um, 
But what what do you think of when you think of Stanford? What what do you think of? Because I'll share a couple of highlights from my trip. hard, <laughs> very hard, hard to get in or hard <laughs> hard to do well. Both hard, all just stop through done. Yeah, hard. So do you know you are right? <laughs> there are some wicked smart kids there. You know, really, really smart. Mm. And one thing I learned is. You know, a lot of times I think of California as just in general, like California doesn't have the intensity of the Northeast because this is the place where you go to the beach and this is the place where you go out and surf, you know, and it tends to take a little bit of the edge off of schools. But Stanford was not a joke. And when I talked to those students, man, I'll tell you, that place is mm. rigorous, very, very wow. rigorous, as rigorous as any academic school in the country. So I would agree with you, really hard to get in. And it takes a kid that can't just be like a grinder. Um, you know, you got to be really, really smart um, to excel there. Now, they do have like big time athletes. You want to know when I say big time athletes, do you realize that if Stanford would have been its own country in the last Olympics, they would have finished sixth in the world for the most medals? Mm, Is that for... crazy? For what sport? So the the Olympics, like they had 40, 48 Olympians. Oh, wow. A lot of people don't know this because, you know, you think of like football and basketball, but Stanford right, right, right. routinely wins more national championships than any other um, school in the country when it comes to sports, you know, hmm. like, so yeah, so they, they have big time, big time, big time athletics there. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Stanford is the culture is so entrepreneurial because of the Silicon Valley mm. being there. And that Silicon Valley just impacts a whole mindset. Mm. So, so kids come there and like, they want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Cause you know, you got like Facebook and Google right around the corner and all these kids are doing internships there. It's almost like a, kind of like a gold rush mindset, like the new frontier. And one of the <laughs> no, one of the leaders I met there said it can be a challenge because sometimes the kids are like if they haven't founded their own company by age twenty one and they don't have venture capital money, they're they're wondering like what's wrong with me because they oh goodness, but <laughs> that is pretty crazy. But there Jeez. but there are super talented kids that you know are going to start the next Amazon out there. The place is mm -hmm. like perfect weather; it's gorgeous. The architecture is like stunning. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating that way. A couple of unique things that I'll say that they kind of look for. They, as high as they are academically, they're a real humble place. And hmm. they have, and they made this really clear. They have zero tolerance for kids that I call like master of the universe kids, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean by that? No, I don't. Wait, wait. You get these kids that kind of think that they're all that in a bag of chips. You know, they don't, that's going to, that's going to throw you right into the denial pile. If they pick up that, like a level of arrogance or entitlement. Really? That's they interesting. They have zero tolerance for that. And they're very, they, you know, it's funny. I was talking to, um, one of their former admission, um, officers and, and, and he was like, you know, at Stanford, they don't need to tell you they're great because they're just great. And they're very humble. Like their admission office is humble. The people are humble and they have they're really going to be turned off if they sense that level of arrogance. The other okay. thing that turns them off and they made this so clear is if somebody is like a, what we call a grade grubber, they said, if we get any sense, like this is a kid that pushed back on the teachers, like, why didn't I get an A? Or if the parent pushed back and said, why did my kid get an A? Like there's just not going to be any tolerance for any of that kind of stuff. Like hmm. at all. Does that surprise you? Yeah, it does actually. No, I that. just yeah, I mean, and it's a nice surprise because mm -hmm. <laughs> I totally did not have that image in my mind. I just saw like hardcore. Arr, arr, arr. No, they're a very humble place for all their excellence, and you know, it's a huge campus, by the way, like the second largest campus in the country. So, oh, really? Yeah, they didn't know that either. Yeah, wow. so it's not a place where you're just going to walk all around. But you know, one thing that was so cool—they have their own free internal bus system. So I would just hop oh, on the Stanford buses and just boogie all around Palo Alto. It was nice. <laughs> and it's free, too. Wow. So it's a huge, huge, huge comp uh, uh, campus. So I would say the kind of student that would do well there is going to be very, very self-confident. Um, they're going to be wicked smart. 
They're going to be really good at relationship building. They're going to be really comfortable with who they are in their own skin. Um, they're going to be mentally prepared to be able to handle not being at the top of their class. That's really hard when you have all these kids who are like Mr. Everything, and then they go off and they're just average. Um, they're going to be a kid that's really willing to self-advocate. That's also really important to stand out there. And it's not only in Stanford, but it's happening all across the country, this mental health crisis. Uh, but we talked at length there. We met with their mental health people. Uh, guess how many additional mental health counselors they're adding this year to their staff, Anika? 35. Well, good guess. 30. Oh, look at that. That's a lot. In one year to add 30 more mental health counselors? So how many did they have? How, how, don't what know. makes a total? How I does that know, make? I don't know, but I just know that's a lot of new people to hire in one department. Mm. I mean, I mean, it's not like this is a school, you know, you know University of Minnesota or Arizona State with 60,000 people. Um, but the place is just immaculate. The lawns are exquisite. Everything is just so well manicured and well taken care of. And um, you know what the minimum wage is on the campus, by the way? Take a guess what the minimum wage for students <laughs> for pay. Like Fif- a student job. 15 yeah, fifteen dollars. How'd you know? Like fifteen twenty or fifteen thirty? I'm just <laughs> I'm totally spitting this stuff out. I had no idea. <laughs> but it needs to be because Palo Alto is like now. Palo Alto is expensive. In fact, something came is out it? of Palo Alto. They said that if you are un, if you make under one hundred thirty thousand, it's regarded as low income in Palo Alto mm. because of the cost of housing. Cost of living is just off the charts. Yeah, yeah. And gas range from three ninety to four hundred five. Ooh wee. Mm. But I, yeah. I, I will say I left thoroughly impressed with this institution. Um, and, you know, it's known for its STEM and its ridiculous computer science and top notch mm-hmm. engineering. And it's known for its entrepreneurship. But it's a powerhouse in the humanities, too. And I think it really goes under, um, you know, it, it just goes under noticed in the humanities. Mm-hmm. like. The other thing I'll say is they have these cultural centers to help kids transition. And it's like in different areas, right? Like it could be LGBTQ. Did I get that right? I always say that wrong. I think so. Yeah. They could be that or it it could be Native American or Black African American or Latino or first gen and under, you know, and they have these centers and literally like houses that kids can go Mm -hmm. to for support. And so How we, many students are there? How many students are there? Stanford, I think, has 6,800 undergrads. It's pretty close that's to that. That's it? Yeah, that's what I'm oh. saying. So when you add in 30 counselors. Wow. Yeah. I thought it'd be more than that. No, Way I think maybe 6,400. It's like, I think I th- I'm pretty sure that their, their class is 1,600 in incoming class. Um, they've had the highest yield multiple years in a row. 83% of kids that accept their offer go. Hmm. Um, and so... I, I just left very, very, very impressed, but it is for a certain kind of kid because it's just really hard when kids ha- have to adjust to being average and they've been Mr. Everything. Hmm. But they can do it. Kudos to you, Stanford. I didn't know. I'm glad, Mark, you were able to shed that light on them. No, they're they're really, really good people. I think at some point I'd like to have maybe their mental health um, counselor. She was amazing. She'd come over from mm. MIT. Um, and she had such a perspective on all the trends that were going. Because the one thing I wanted to ask is how much of these challenges are Stanford, right? Like mm-hmm. you're all these kids at the top of the class. Now they have to come in versus other things. And it's this is much more of a national epidemic. It has a lot more to do with technology and kids not having as so much social interaction. And right. now they're living in this um, online world. And everything looks perfect on people's social media pages and it doesn't feel perfect in their life. It's stuff Mm. like that going on. It's adding to the pressure. So anyway, we got another interview coming up on mental health. Let's call it a day, Nika. All right. Sounds good. See you later. All right. And the other thing about Stanford is that you, you really can't understand Stanford without understanding what it's like to go to school. 10 weeks at a time in quarters, which is what Stanford uses for its academic calendar, which differs from the more traditional 15-week semesters. Now, when you talk to students at Stanford, this is actually a a really hotly contested debate amongst them, the pros and cons of the quarter system. I don't have time to go into all the differences between the quarter system and the semester system here, but they are considerable, and I would really urge anyone 
to understand the differences between the quarter system and the semester system if you're considering a Stanford or a Northwestern or a University of California or one of the schools that uses the quarter system. Another thing about Stanford is that it does not admit students by major and it does not admit students by college. So, so what this does is it really gives the school more of a broad-based mentality. And, and one of my most fascinating conversations I had when I was there was actually on the Stanford bus. I struck up this conversation with a grad student who was from Detroit, who had got his bachelor's at Northwestern. And he talked at length with me about how less pre-professional Stanford was than Northwestern, uh, because you were not applying directly by major or by college, and how much he liked Stanford so much more because he found the students to be so much more open-minded about what they were going to do with their life. Now, a little tip for our college counselors. One pet peeve that Stanford has is when you describe students with a string of effusive adjectives. Stanford wants examples of student backgrounds. They want examples of how the student has demonstrated the character traits and in very real and very sort of concrete ways. I also want to talk a little bit about Stanford's financial aid, which is very important. If you have a $65,000 adjusted gross income with typical assets, you pay zero. That's right, zero. And about 15% of Stanford students will pay zero for tuition, room and board, student fees, books, travel, and personal miscellaneous. Stanford grant will cover your full cost of attendance. There will be a student work uh, component there during the school year in the summer, but that's it. Um, Harvard has a similar plan that actually covers 20% of all the students at Harvard will literally pay zero. But remember, Harvard has no athletic scholarships. Um, and before you criticize others for not offering this, just recognize we're talking about two of the wealthiest schools in the country. So you may be thinking, well, I don't make 65000 Well, if you make 125000 or less and you have what are known as typical assets, you will get free tuition at Stanford, uh, making your parent contribution 17200 for everything. Um, this will often be less than your state school. So the bottom line is, don't let the sticker price of 75K intimidate you if your income is not exceptionally high. You can qualify for a tremendous amount of need-based aid. 47% of students get need-based aid at Stanford. Remember, Stanford does have no merit scholarships. But 13% of students, or about 800 of the 6,800 undergrads, do get athletic scholarships. So a total of 60% in total get financial aid. And one thing Stanford announced recently, it's going to help a lot of people. People might think this is minor, but it's not. They are now not counting home equity against you when they assess your assets. And for a lot of families that don't have a high income, but they have a lot of home equity, the home equity can knock you out of receiving any or a lot of need-based financial aid. So for those who have modest incomes and a lot of home equity, you could qualify for tens of thousands of dollars in need-based aid. Stanford truly is one of the exceptional universities in America, and it's not even 140 years old. Many of its competitors on the East Coast are twice as old. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenball. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.